In this interactive video, we're going to talk about the post-axial period, which is the next big chunk of history that Karen Armstrong treats and discusses in her book. And we're going to talk about the relationship um, and the status of mythology in this post-axial uh, period, which goes from circa 200 BCE all the way to about 1500 CE. So things remain kind of the same for quite a while until 1500. And that period's known in, in our book as the post-axial period. So first, taking a look at the concept, just the concept of the post-axial age. Um, essentially, it's characterized by the development of the foundations that were laid down in the axial age. So the sorts of ideas and paradigm shifts and changes that occurred during the axial age are developed and kind of ferment and um, grow during the post-axial age. And religiously speaking, Monotheism is cemented through the Abrahamic religions, which are Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all of which, however, claim to be historically rather than mythically based. And philosophically speaking, rationalism begins to flourish, then it takes a backseat to religion, and then it begins to flourish again throughout this long period of history. And rationalism is arguably hostile toward myth and mythos, which mythos, again, is, is mythological thinking. Um, rationalism deeply favors reason and logos as the supreme power of the universe. However, and importantly, Neither the Abrahamic religions nor Greek rationalism could dispense with myth entirely. They still needed it. They all continued to use mythology to explain their mystical insights or to, to respond to a crisis. So in, um, it, in some ways you can consider the post-axial period as kind of like a mythological hangover, right? So first we'll look at uh, Judaism. So remember that Judaism is the oldest of the monotheistic re religions. And just as a reminder, monotheism means belief in one God only, as opposed to, um, as opposed to, let's say, like the, um, the ancient Greeks who believed in many different gods, which is known as pantheism, right? So Judaism is the oldest of the monotheistic religions, and it emerged from polytheistic Yahwism during the Axial Age. And Judaism carried on mythological elements of Yahwism, including the creation story, uh, the Garden of Eden, flood, um, and heroic and national myths. So Judaism as a monotheistic religion emerged from polytheistic, excuse me, polytheistic, I did it again, polytheistic Yahwism, and Yahwism was deeply mythological. So Judaism carried that on throughout this period. And there were also Jewish mythological and supernatural beings that were written about during this period, the early part of this period, mind you. Um, so we've got uh, angels and golems and dibooks and uh, Leviathan. Well, this is dibooks up here. And Leviathan and um, the Witch of Endor. Those are all some Jewish and mythological slash supernatural beings that were still um, being discussed and about whom stories were being told, i.e. myths were being generated um, during this period. 
And then there's, there was also Jewish mysticism that, that emerged during this post-axial period. Um, and the Hekhalat and Merkaba methods in literature, which are also known as the throne chariot literature, stemmed from the book of Ezekiel and is heavily mythological still. And these versions of early Jewish mysticism lasted from about 1 BCE until the emergence of like full Kabbalah in um, 1200 to 1300 CE. And Jewish Kabbalah is a set of esoteric teachings that are meant to explain the relationship between the unchanging eternal God, um, the mysterious Ein Sof, or um, the infinite, and the mortal finite universe, which is, um, you know, where we live, God's creation. So it forms the foundation of mystical religious interpretations within Judaism. Then we have Christianity, which emerged during this period. And Christianity was essentially, again, a development of axial age, um, late axial age. Monotheism came out of Judaism. Um, Jesus of Nazareth, who was squarely in this historical period, was a real historical being. But his disciples and Paul the Apostle essentially transformed him into a mythical figure, um, borrowing from the old stories of sky gods and human divine births and immortality. And hopefully you can remember these, stor these stories and myths from um, earlier in the course. Well, Christianity developed out of Judaism and all of these like Paleolithic and Neolithic era mythological um, beings and stories. And St. Paul spread the teachings of Jesus in the first century world and created Christian communities in Asia Minor and Europe between 30 CE, which was roughly around Jesus, the time of Jesus' death, and 50 CE. And the main myth here was that God sent his son to earth, the son was crucified and resurrected for the benefit of humanity. Um, the son would soon return from the dead and those who belonged to the son would live with him forever. So that's um, the, the, that's the myth or the story in Christianity. And again, remember, this is a humanities class in um, mythology. So it's meant to take a humanities approach. This isn't a the theology class or a religion class. So no offense when we, if, when we refer to Jesus's story as mythological, right? This is a different perspective. It's the perspective that this course takes. Just reminding you, Okay, other religions recognize and revere Jesus, but don't subscribe to the way he was mythologized, which is very interesting. Like, for instance, Judaism doesn't accept Jesus as the Messiah, didn't believe he was divine or resurrected. And Islam often accepts that his virginal birth or accepts his virginal birth but rejects that he was God incarnate or son of God, and also rejects that he was crucified and resurrected. Instead, he was raised into heaven, according to some Islamic traditions. So it's an interesting point, is that both of um, these religions, the other two big monotheistic religions, say, yes, there was a Jesus, but Judaism says, but he wasn't the Messiah and he wasn't divine and he wasn't resurrected. He was just a man. And Islam says, okay, maybe he was born of a virgin, but he wasn't the son of God and he wasn't divine and he wasn't resurrected either. He just was raised into heaven. It's Christianity that accepts this, um, that accepts the um, ascension, the resurrection and the ascension into heaven.
Then we have Islam, and Islam was also a development of axial age monotheism. So Muhammad was a real human being. He lived from 570 CE to 632 CE. And Islamic doctrine teaches that he was a prophet and was divinely inspired to preach and confirm the monotheistic teachings of Adam, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and the other prophets. And Islamic creation myths are similar and sometimes the same as those found in Judaism and Christianity, no surprise, and Islamic mythology incorporates spiritual entities as well, like um, angels, which are good, and um, jinn, which are morally ambivalent, like neither good nor bad, kind of, and shayatin, which, is, which are the bad ones. Then we have Greek rationalism. And Greek rationalism was also a development of axial age thought, and it continued to thrive for many centuries in the post-axial period. And this means that logos was emphasized and mythos was considered old fashioned and irrational. So this attitude toward mythos and the mystical experience influenced Christian and Muslim scholars to attempt to quote unquote rationalize their religions. And what was in that this was a very interesting time in um in history. This uh, this was around let's say like eleven hundreds. Um we have Saint Anselm's ontological argument for the existence of God, where he's trying to lay down a rational proof for God's existence, like an argument with premises and conclusions. Um, we have St. Aquinas's five proofs for the existence of God, five different reason-based, logical, logic-based arguments for the existence of God. Notice the difference um, in earlier times God was um, made himself known or became known by people through a mystical experience, through mythos, through some sort of spiritual intuition. And, and as a result of Greek rationalism, we have attempts to say, let's use logic to prove God's existence instead of this mystical, mythological, um, spiritual approach. And then also the falsifa, uh, mutazil, and kalam schools of Islam strove to eliminate or at least delimit the mythological and mystical elements of Islam. So this is how Greek rationalism, which began to develop and, and ferment during this post-axial period, eventually influenced um, religion. Uh, Christianity and, and Islam started to try to incorporate or portions, right, segments of Christianity and Islam began to want to um, incorporate more logic and logos and de-emphasize myth and mythos. So then we have our takeaways from Karen Armstrong's argument here. After the Axial Age, there'd be no comparable period of change, no period of change that quite measured up to the Axial Age for over a millennium. So in spiritual and religious matters, we still rely on the insights of the actual uh, Axial Sages and philosophers, and the status of myth remained basically the same until the 16th century CE. It had been um, demoted but it wasn't dead yet. It still was the kind of hung around as either something to work against or incorporate a few elements of, but it certainly wasn't gone. Again, my analogy here is it was like a myth hangover during this period. And 
The big three monotheistic faiths claim, at least in part, to be historically rather than mythically based, right? Because history, as logic and logos be, started to be, take a more dominant role in history, it follows that you want to base your religions on something that you think actually happened in the past. You say, no, this actually happened. This really happened. It's not just a story. So we see these sorts of um, claims emerging and being um, spread in the monotheistic religions. And because of the uneasy attitude toward myth, which had entered um, the Western mind with Plato and Aristotle, monotheists would periodically try to make their religion conform to the rational standards of philosophy. And just at the moment when Jews and Muslims were beginning to retreat from the attempt to rationalize their mythology, Western Christians seized on the project with an enthusiasm that they would never entirely lose. Again, that enthusiasm was one to, it was to rationalize their mythology, was to embrace more logos and de-emphasize mythos, embrace more quote-unquote rational and logical thinking and, um, and negate or dismiss the um, mythological um, and spiritual sort of thinking. So as a result, throughout this period, remember this was a long period, um, people started to lose touch, Armstrong argues, with the meaning of myth. So the next great transformation in human history which would make it really difficult for people to think mythically, had its origins in Western Europe. And that is the next historical period, the next and the last historical period that we'll take a look at in the next um, interactive video. It's the last period that Armstrong discusses. It's, and it's the end of the book, it's the last chapter. Excuse me. So quick again, topics covered, um, mythology and post-axial age thought in the West. And we took a look at some changes that were occurring um, in uh, Judy. So the, really not just changes, but the emergence of the, mon the big three monotheistic religions during this period, which were Judaism, Christianity and Islam, and we took a look at Greek rationalism and the impact it had specifically on Christianity and Islam, right? And the role that the, the ever steadily decreasing role that myth, mythos and mythology was playing in post-axial age thought. Once again, just as a reminder, post the post-axial age um, is covers 200 BC to 1500 CE. So that's a 1700 year period that all of this occurred in. And then we covered um, Karen Armstrong's, her, the takeaways from her argument there.